what was the genesis of this? Why, of all the projects that piqued your interest, what was it about this particular story? Uh, the catalyst for doing a record about Victor Hara and his life was Patrick Jones, um, who's somebody I've known uh, from a very early, very early age, and he's the brother of um, Nicky Wire in the band. Um, so he's a published poet and he's a, and he's a you know, many times performed playwright. And he was always a big influence um, on the Manics, I suppose. He told me about Jack Kerouac and Adam Ginsberg and Gregory Corso and Lawrence, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, all the beat writers, you know, he, he turned me on to. Yeah, I think it was about two years ago he was just doing lots of writing and uh, he sh he's always shown me lots of stuff he's writing that he doesn't necessarily release, you know. And he was doing lots and lots of uh, writing about Victor Hara and his life and in the end I kind of realised that he wasn't going to do anything with it so I decided to turn it into an album. Can you hear it moving through the fields of Can you feel it through the tons of I didn't know that much about Victor's life till I started doing some kind of research before this. And what's fascinating is how his influence and life has kind of spread out in so many different directions. How what he stood for and achieved has kind of dissipated, like, all over the world. It's a fascinating story, isn't it? It is, yeah. I mean, um, it's amazing to see what an educational kind of tool music was when I was young. Because the, the first time I heard of uh, Victor Hara was through people writing songs about him mm. um, or people covering his songs. So you had people like U2 writing songs about him, people like Clexico, uh, people like David Ewan, who was a, a folk singer and a, and a politician for Plaid Cymru down here in Wales, had written a song about him. They were records by people like Working Week back in the 80s. It was very influential. Then you begin to realise that they were ballets based around, well, kind of inspired by him. Yeah. They were the ballet called Ghost Dances. And, and then you had people like Dorian Lewinsky who had written chapters about him in his, in his books about um, uh, kind of uh, protest singing. So, yeah, he, his influence had stretched far and wide uh, without people actually knowing any of his songs. People knew him as a, as a presence, as a musical presence and as a presence of something that was for good. Setting music to someone's life is, is, there's a responsibility there. It is, yeah. Um, his, his story is one with a, with a terrible ending, mm. you know, it, it, where his, his, his life is ended by um, the coup that takes over the, the Ayonde kind of government in 1973. The Pinochet coup that takes over um, is the one that kind of ends his life, is the one that murders him effectively. So, you know, you, you're doing this and you're knowing that there's a terrible tragic ending to it all, but you, I don't know, it's, 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 it's a good question because you're aware that other people have told, you know, I've written about him before, mm. you're not there, just everybody else has inspired you to write about him to a certain degree. So, you know, you, you, you've got to show a lot of humility about that. A lot of people have, have touched upon this story before and somebody else has lived this story and somebody else died in this story too. So, it, yeah, it is a, it is something that you've got to be careful about um, and you've got to show respect. But as soon as you start delving into Victor's life, you realise that it's unbelievable. Um, his beginnings, his humble beginnings, you know, from the kind of peasantry cra you know, class, um, you know, from the, from, the plan from the plantations in Chile, you know, and then his journey of self-improvement, of learning how to write and play music on his mother's guitar, being inspired by somebody called Violetta Parra, um, who was, was an amazing woman in Chile that uh, kept Chilean song alive. And then he starts directing plays, <laughs> and then he starts teaching. Yeah. And, and, he, and he's involved in, like, you know, getting a, a, a very progressive government into government in Chile. So his story is is, is manifest in just, like, in, in being engaged in, in culture, in Chilean culture especially. So if you delve into it, there's so much detail there, and it's inspiring. But you're right, you've got to be careful and you've got to be respectful. of my chat with James yeah. Dean Bradfield. Earlier we heard him talking about his new solo album, Even in Exile, which is a collaboration with uh, Patrick Jones, the acclaimed poet and playwright, and James telling the story of Victor Hara, the Chilean mm. 
poet and singer and theatre director and activist. But this doesn't mean that James has taken his eye off the Manic Street Preachers, and in fact he's been working on the demos that may become their next album. But we also talked about that. We talked about how much he's missing playing live, and also what it's like not seeing your bandmates. These are the people you spent <laughs> year after year with, and just living in each other's pockets. And it turned into quite a sweet conversation about that connection between bandmates, and also how important it is having an audience when you're a band. Here he is. If you're in a group, this has meant you haven't seen the people that you've played with for so long, that you've sat on buses with, that you've sat in waiting rooms and service stations and just been part of each other's life. And obviously everyone needs a bit of a break after a kind of album or whatever, but, you know, it's only now that you can kind of see people again. It's quite weird with bands. It's like you are family and now you haven't been able to see each other for ages. How's it been? Well, with us, even more so in terms of, you know, it's kind of, we are like a family because yeah. we've known each other all our lives. And of course, myself and Sean are virtually brothers, you mm. know, so it has been very strange. Um, I think, you know, the idea of the idea of, of the near distant future, which you're always working on as a band, is something that keeps you alive. You know, the idea of a record, the idea of a new set, even just something like quite humdrum, like, you know, having seen what Sean's new drum kit looks like and... <laughs> <laughs> I love red sparkle in it, you know. Kind of, <laughs> yeah, I know. All our moves are rubbish about like, oh, I've got a new amp set up, <laughs> going stereo through a Mesa boogie and I'm going through all that rubbish. All those things you realise is really are really important. Yeah. Um, and the pressure of looking at the near distant future and, and, and wondering if an audience is connect, going to connect to a new song, wondering if Nick and Sean are going to like this new demo I'm going to present with them. Wondering if, like, you know, what lyric Nick has come up with now. Wondering what, how Sean is going to completely change his song in the studio. <laughs> All those things just, like, are lacking um, now. Um, and, it's, you know, and, and you start thinking about, you know, the symbolic nature of, of going on stage and what the, what the audience give you, you know. Sometimes you walk on stage and after literally five seconds, you know that the audience are going to absolutely transform the night. You know, they can make it a 10 out of 10 night and at a, at a kind of panel beating, just brilliant rock and roll night, or sometimes it can be average. You, re you begin to realise that the audience have a gigantic part to play in your life. And, and once you know that, this complete and utterly stamp, rubber stamps it, you know that you, a band can't really exist in a live sense without an audience. We can talk about all these streaming gigs, you know, we can talk about, you know, reaching out, you know, kind of like, you know, in, in a new way. But God, if he told me tomorrow that I, I wouldn't be playing in front of an audience again, you know, that would be a new era of Euro history, rock and roll history. You know, rock and roll needs an audience. You know, you need them in front of them. You need to smell them. You need to see them. You need to react to them. <laughs> I've, I've, I've got a couple of examples of gigs that I was going to go and see, but the one big example was I was going to see Ramstein in the Cardiff, in, a, in the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff. You know, that's a hell of a gig to cancel. So, yeah. like, <laughs> so like uh, because, you know, when you're going to see Ramstein, you know, you're expecting to see kind of like, you know, burlesque yeah. theatre. Yeah. You know, you're looking to see kind of like, you know, Kafka esque <laughs> kind of. Uh, kind of nightmares wrapped in like X-rated slasher movie <laughs> ratings and pure, pure metal. And so to miss out on a gig like that left me pretty bereft, you know. So I, I'm along with a lot of people in, in I'm missing my gigs at the moment, definitely. Yeah. 